It is so great to see each of you all today. You may not think of the hymn Amazing Grace as a Christmas song. I have to say, I hadn't ever thought of it before as one, and it's not designated as one, it's a general hymn. But it's the one that came to my mind when I was reflecting on Paul's letter to Titus that we read, that Jonathan read for us just a moment ago. In Titus, we hear, in this Paul's letter to Titus, we hear these words, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all. And it was in that word, appeared, that I recalled the words of amazing grace, in which that one line says, how precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Which do you think comes first, grace or belief? Which is the chicken and which is the egg? Is it our experience of grace that comes first, which allows and prompts belief? Or is it our belief that which comes first and opens up, us up to the experience of grace? Do you know the story behind the hymn, Amazing Grace? The short version, the condensed version, is that John Newton, who was the captain of ships back in the 1700s, primarily of slave ships, had a moment off the coast of Ireland when his boat was about to capsize and he cried out to the Lord and he had a revelatory epiphany experience and it changed his life forever. That is true, except that is the oversimplified version. Indeed, John Newton was off the coast of Ireland when his boat almost capsized, and he prayed to God, and suddenly, by some miracle, the, the cargo under the ship shifted in a direction which then righted the ship, and they floated into the land. And he did have an epiphany experience, and it was from that moment that he decided to read his Bible. But he did not radically change his ways after that event. His total reformation was more gradual, according to bibliography, Dot com, or biography.com. He wrote these words, I cannot consider myself to have been a believer in the full sense of the word until a considerable time after. He did begin reading his Bible at that point and began to view others with more sympathetic perspective. In real life, Newton continued to sell his fellow human beings making three voyages as a captain of two different vessels, the Duke of Argyle and the African. In 1754, he suffered a stroke and retired from the sea, but he continued to invest in the business of the slave trade. In 1764, 10 years after his stroke, he was ordained an Anglican priest. That's the thing I'm ordained as part of. The Episcopal Church is part of the Anglican Communion, the same words were say, said over the head of John Newton as were said over my head. I found this then, this understanding of him upsetting to think of a person of the cloth could be in support of the slave trade. Maybe you find that upsetting too. But he was not alone. I want to highlight John Newton's story to illustrate that conversion to following Jesus is a lifelong process. It doesn't happen in a moment. Indeed, after he was ordained an Anglican priest, he wrote 280 hymns to accompany his services. And he wrote the words for Amazing Grace in 1772. So here we are almost 20 years after his stroke. It wasn't set to the tune that we know until later. And it was not until 1788, 34 years after leaving the business of the slave trade, that he renounced his former slaving profession by publishing a blazing pamphlet called Thoughts Upon the Slave Trade. The tract described the horrific conditions on the ships and Newton apologized for making a public statement so many years after participating in the slave trade. He wrote, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection for me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. End quote. The pamphlet was so popular that it was reprinted several times and sent to every member of parliament. And under the leadership of William Wilberforce, the English civil government outlawed slavery in Great Britain 
in 1807, and Newton lived to see it, dying in December of that year. I think, you know, if we're honest, we're usually resistant to God's grace. Because in its coming to us, it reveals our faults and failings. It's only at the moment when we realize our limitations, our inability to save ourselves, that we then see grace appear. It's when we recognize our own shortcomings that we then begin to notice. And who wants to look at our own shortcomings? It is by God's grace, I believe, that John Newton was given the strength, I'm certain of it, to move past his humiliation in order to speak up against slavery. Sometimes people just stay in their humiliation, trying to hide it. I highlight John Newton's story to remind us that oversimplification can deny us the full benefit of our humanity. This is true of the oversimplification of the story of Jesus' birth also. In that first nativity, it was the humble and lowly that went to see the Christ child. The rich weren't there at the side of the cradle. To receive grace must come without pretense or a privileged posture. And if we're honest, most of us would choose the privilege over the humility, even though it's humility which makes room for grace to appear. Even John Newton chose the privilege over the humility for 34 years. It took 34 years for grace to work through John Newton's entire being, 16 years for his own words of amazing grace to finally sink into him and change his life fully. I believe that this is most certainly why Jesus speaks of the blessings of the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who suffer. The Beatitudes remind us that it's in our humility that God's grace is made known. Those that are poor need not navigate untangling themselves from privilege, which many of us, all of us, I dare say, have to do. And it is when we become untangled from that that we are able to receive the transformational grace of God. Do you hear the good news, my friends, and how God's grace breaks through? How God's grace continues to pursue us for 34 years, pursued John Newton, even before that, I would say, always giving us a chance to notice. Isn't that good news? That's what I want to leave you with on this Christmas Eve, that God pursues us that God pursues you, revealing God's grace time and time again. Do you see its appearance? When we are humble, God's grace will appear. You know, the tune that we know of Amazing Grace is written by William Walker in 1835. And we do know these words. I'm struck with how many people know the words to the hymn Amazing Grace, at least the first line. Almost any civil engagement, you'll even hear almost everyone participate in the song Amazing Grace. And perhaps this is where belief can make a way. You see, John Newton began reading his Bible, and when he did that, he began to notice what he didn't notice. God works through us as we enter into our belief, and you're here tonight because of your belief, right? You wanted to hear the story again of God's love for us in the birth of Jesus the Christ. You came here tonight not because you've never heard this story, but because you have heard this story. You've heard this story before and you want to hear it again to remember the power of the incarnation. So when we sing these carols tonight and we hear these words from scripture, we, and even when we come forward to receive the blessed sacrament, we then remember ourselves loved by God God with us, Emmanuel. And every Sunday when we gather as a community, it's for that same purpose, to be encouraged, to be encouraged in our belief so that we might see the appearance of grace. It is indeed our whole life process. You know, I know of a person who leads retreats, and he told us of a story once that when he would lead a retreat, he would send some people, they would send the retreat participants off for a while into the nature, and he would have them choose a point out there somewhere, a tree, a stream, a rock, somewhere out a distance from them, 
And he invited them to believe that when they got to that point, they would see something amazing, that something would be revealed to them. He said to them, do not move until you are convinced of that. And so they did. Once they came to the point of believing that they would see something on the other side or at that point, then they did see something. He said it was marvelous to hear them come back and share what they had discovered, what had been revealed to them in a place that was so familiar. Indeed, it was your belief which brought you here. You said, let's go to St. Stephen's tonight so that we can see and hear something that we need to hear and see. And when we come with expectation, indeed, we will see God's grace in our lives and in the lives of others, and it will seem to simply appear. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, they would have not left their flocks, nor the wise men have traveled from the east if they hadn't believed that they would see something. And their seeing the baby Jesus was the start of a life of discovery of their salvation. My friends, God pursues us. God reveals God's grace time and time again. Do you see it? God comes to us in the humility, and thus we find him when we are humble. On that night, more than 2,000 years ago, God's grace appeared. How precious. How in an infant. How transforming. Jesus showed us the way of our salvation in following him. God will not give up on us our whole life long. Thanks be to God. Amen.